Good morning. My name is Terrell Lee Johnson, and I will be moderating this conversation on does going local um, save traditional foods? <laughs> so, um, and then, so I'm just going to be uh, going down the the panel here and have them introduce themselves and give a little description of what they do, and um, then we'll end. <coughs> At the very end with uh, Deborah, and we'll um, start the conversation. And I really just want this to be very relaxing and just a conversation and thoughts about what what each of the panels here um, think about that title, and um, hopefully get some dialogue happening between the panelists and the audience. So, can I do it? Uh, uh, good morning to everyone. I want to, uh, but actually my name is Emilio Vallon. Original, I come from South America. It's, uh, he's right because I now have very good voice to tell him very high. But anyway, I'm hoping you can understand the, the, the words what I'm going to say to you. I come from South America. My name is Emilio Vallon. Actually, I come from the Quechua or the Inca culture myself. I was very lucky over here because I met with very interesting people, and then I was working in Tizuque Pueblo. I have over here one of the, my colleagues present over here in this panel. And then, probably when I have to give a talk, I, will, I can start already yet, or only my presentation, my name. Uh, yeah, small introduction, then we'll start. That's actually, this is uh, who I am anyway. Uh, good morning, I'm Richard Ford. I'm a retired University of Michigan professor who lives in Santa Fe. I had my original training in ethnobotany out here as an undergraduate, uh, living in what was then San Juan Pueblo, now Okeowenge. I've maintained a friendship with Okeowenge through all these years, and now I'm retired, I'm working for them in terms of being an expert witness for their water cases and having to relate that to the plants that I had learned from them originally. Good morning, I'm Louis Hina from Tisuki Pueblo. I'm a permaculture design instructor. Uh, Richard Ford is one of my mentors. I've created environmental programs in three different communities, um, teaching about traditional land management, uh, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, currently, you really have to speak up. Oh, yeah. currently, <clears throat> currently, I'm taking care of my dad. He's uh, fighting cancer. And I'm also having fun taking care of my grandkids, <laughs> along with doing what I do. I'm uh, Deborah Madison. I'm a Bay Area transplant. I've lived here about 25 years in Galisteo. Um, the day after I moved here, I was asked if I wouldn't mind running the farmer's market. Um, <laughs> literally the day after, um, which I did. And it did for, for a long time in various capacities. And I mention that because that's what I want to talk about in terms of um, going local and so forth. Um, other than that, I'm a food writer and gardener. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. When I was asked to, do, um, to uh, be part of this um, discussion, I was quite interested in the topic. You know, um, does local save traditional foods? And for myself, at first, as an indigenous person, uh, being native, I, I sort of got upset about it. You know, but then again, I was thinking the work that I've been doing for the past 20 years, you know, that question does come up. You know, and that question, I guess, is something that, for myself, uh, is can experience and say yes it does, but then again, given the other things about, you know, do, um, can we meet the demand, you know, of revitalizing a lot of the traditional foods that um, a lot of native communities around the country are really struggling to keep alive, you know, so 
that was a question that I had for myself, but it would be very interesting to hear what the rest of the panelists think about that, that question there. So, and I'll just throw it out there, and whoever would like to go first, please. Where are you going? Okay. <laughs> the farmer's market is key. Well, the, the farmer's market to me means local food. Um, and, and, and in answering your question, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, going local maybe does help. But there's some if, ands, and buts with education. And the question, for whom does it help? When I first, first came to New Mexico in the 70s, the farmer's market had four farmers in it. And there was choke cherry jelly and chilies. And that was what brought me to New Mexico, ultimately. Not the tomatoes, not the cucumbers, not the carrots. Um, when I managed the farmer's market, there was, I'll just tell the story, a man from um, Santo Domingo, from Cuba, who had um, melons, native melons. And they're not very sweet. They are closer to cucumbers, almost, than melons. And, and, um, and they were, they're actually quite wonderful to use. You can use them in interesting ways. But they didn't appeal to the people shopping there. He no longer showed up. So there's a whole plant that's gone from the wider public. And I, I think that's a shame. Um, at the same time, there are plants. And some of these are post-contact. I, I just made a list this morning of what we can find, cota, apple mint tea, um, chicos, pozole in all colors. Um, cornmeal, uh, blue corn, chilies in, in all forms, or no bread, also from Kiwa, um, and fruit pies, uh, calitas, verdelagas, um, uh, sage, the artemisia tridentata, um, Navajo churro lamb, uh, the choke cherry jelly. So there are foods there, but I find in, in, unless somebody points you to them and says something about them, I, I'm not sure they're bought. I mean, they're bought enough that people are managing to show up at the market and sell them year after year, but who's buying them? Not Native people, because they're not shopping there. So um, I, I think to some degree the market does keep these traditions alive, but not in the communities from which they're from. Oh, and there's well, bolita beans, too. <laughs> Um, Louis, would you like to say something about the topic there? And what your community is doing? Well, at Tesuki Pueblo, we have a vision. It's called the Tesuki Plan, where all the community members got together. Now, the first one came out when I was still in high school. And we all sat together and we put our visions onto paper. And within that, we said we needed the healthier communities for our, for our, for our place. And what we did was we consolidated a lot of the small farms there at Tsuki into larger parcels. And that happened around the 70s, 80s, and we started uh, fixing our irrigation systems, putting them, piping them, lining our irrigation lines, but at the same time, there goes all our, some of our wild fruits. Um, I remember coming to the farmer's market and being sold out even before we opened the back end of the truck. Back then, there was nothing about organic certification, although at Tsuki Pueblo, the council there already made a conscious decision to say no chemicals on Tsuki. So we've never used chemicals at Tsuki. And Within this plan, it talks about what's needed within our community. Uh, it talks about greenhouses. We have those greenhouses now. We talked about a wellness center, uh, housing the, the senior center, a uh, gymnasium. We have that now. You know? And so we, we check off every one of these vision statements that we've made and we pat ourselves on the back and we say, let's tackle another one. So right now, with, with, with Tsuki Pueblo, one of the focal points of everything here within northern New Mexico, or even internationally, I would say, because Tsuki has a name for itself on an international basis. 
And to me, going local would mean all our communities working together. Kiwa, Tetsuge, Nambe, Sunni, Hopi, okay? And then even with our brothers, remember uh, Dr. Frank talk, talking about the, the different peoples here in the nation, the bison people. We can all work together and create lines of distribution within our, within our communities. And I'm just talking about Native American communities, okay? We've also established our own farmer's markets because I'd rather ride my bike to my farmer's market versus getting into the troca and driving 10 miles into Santa, right? I hate coming to Santa. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, the different foodstuffs that we, we've learned about these past couple of days is out there, but it comes down to the education. Right now, it's very easy for me to go to McDonald's, right? and get whatever we want. But is it healthy? No, it's killing us. But that's our mentality now. This country, we're censored. We don't hear what we want to hear. We hear what the big dollar people tell us what we want to hear. All we hear is bad things. We don't hear anything good. We don't hear anything good about Oh, this little community helped this community out, or this individuals helped these individuals out. None of that is there, but that's what needs to happen. We need to communicate between us. We need to respect each other. How can, how can a community thrive on, on their own food systems when local governments come and say no? You know, the only, uh, people understand about the, know about the, uh, the farm there in, in Los Angeles? that got torn down, and local people and, and activists raised money to buy that property because it was in operation for over 20 years, got leveled out. Here in Santa Fe, on the south end of town here, there's local neighbors, neighborhoods that are trying to establish little gardens, but you have neighbors fighting them. So what is it going to come to? We have to respect each other, care for each other, share. And that's what, as, as Native American communities, indigenous communities, that's how we're brought up, respect, caring, and sharing. We grow the crops. We invite everybody. It feels part of it now, part of our community. He sees all that. But the conscious thing I think that ha needs to happen is leadership needs to understand what the constituents are saying, what the constituents want, not what the big dollar people are telling us. This and this and that. We go before the state legislature fighting for GMOs, protecting our seeds. We get three minutes of presentation. And mind you, these guys are my representatives. They don't know me. But you get big biotech company coming in, they get seven pages of paper, and they get all the time they want, and they're on first name basis. That's what we're fighting. That's what we're up against. One of the things I'm not seeing in here is young people. It looks like I'm the only one. <laughs> we need to focus on the younger generation because they're the ones that are coming up. They're the next voters. They're the ones that are, that are going to be eating this food. They're the ones that, that are fighting for what we're saying here at this table. We need to support them. And, and here in, within Santa Fe, or within in urban centers, you know, we can tear up the lawns. Instead of zero escaping, you could put a, a food scape. Every block could have different types of fruit trees growing. One whole block could have peach trees growing. Another block could have apricot trees. Another block could have manzana growing. 
you look at the landscape out here, this is a pretty good edible landscape if you look outside. We could think that way as, as, as communities, and we can support that. And there's the demand. And if people understand that, it's there. Uh, Dr. Frank mentioned Bertulaga in her talk yesterday. Did you know that plant was going for $28 a pound at New York Farmer's Market? See, right away, kachin kachin, <laughs> hey, man, it's a weed. For us, it's a weed. And she, st and she stated that it has the omega-3 oils as fish. And we step on it all the time. And that's where we need to rethink what we have here and re-educate ourselves as to what's available. Uh, Tezuki Pueblos is known for our seeds. We can go to Sandia Pueblo, uh, Mr. Sam Montoya's operation where he grows his beef on uh, HRM uh, ideas, holistic resource management. Uh, Ghost Ranch has the same program. So there's a lots of different farms and communities that are already doing it. We just got to find some way to come together to feed our communities and to fight legislation. They're telling us now, okay, you can't serve your cicadas no more. Okay, we like cicadas. <laughs> How many of you have tried cicadas? Yeah, good, huh? High in protein. <laughs> But they're here, right? There's another food store. And, and, but that's what's coming down. We have, we have uh, the USDA, they come down with, with regs. We have the cities, the city of Santa Fe or other municipalities coming down with regulations saying, oh, you can't harvest your rainwater. Okay, little things like that, but they add up. And so we need to stand up as communities and say, this is what we want, this is what we want to see for our communities, just like we've done for Tsuki. And the end result would be, my, my vision is the pre-contact of this whole Rio Grande Valley. It's, it's chronicled that it was a garden of Eden when the first Europeans stepped in here. Now, Emilio, yeah. Emilio, Emilio. Um, can you talk about how you, with your background and your, um, ex uh, your, your education and working, uh, coming to Tsuki and working, and uh, what, and what you're doing there? Sure. It's uh, actually I will ask him to the gravel and the spirits before I can sure. give my talk. Usually my tradition when my Indian ways it's we say to the great spirit they can give it to us the chance to understand each other in this room about the things we want to talk or the things we want to think. Anti Ilat Aya Pamita Pacha Haya Uyu Aski Hila and Pikat Haya to us at Kinti. Pachamama we hila sumata pin kaptan takusan kiwanta when I heard the, but anyway, I mentioned my name is Emilio Vallon. I coming over here to United States, maybe people thinking with the American dream to making money, have a fancy car, uh, very fancy clothes, you know, it's uh, usually we think in this is America. When the European people come in 500 years or 1,000 years back to America, they come in with the same dream, gold, silver, now it's oil, killing our people. And the best thing indigenous people they give to the world is the food. I bring these products to you to sell them. Okay, because the way Louis was mentioned, McDonald's, you know, potato chips, pizza hat, you know, and 
these guys sodas, you know, tomato cans, you know, all these type of the things, we don't have time. We don't have time to make money, to buy all these things we need to buy. All the time we are under stress because we now using this technology. We cutting the connection, the way Luigena was mentioned, communication. We don't have any more. We thinking with the computers, all these things, we have very fast communication. It doesn't exist, this type of things. When here, the brother from Arizona, Terrell, is asking me, what's my background? I grew up in Indian farm myself. With my grandpa, my grandma, giving to me the seeds to plant in when I was a little boy. Okay? I didn't want to go to school. I went to school uh, learning Spanish because it was nice. I didn't want to go to school because everybody laughing about your Spanish talking or your, you know, the same you guys can laughing about my accent in English, okay? But anyway, it was very hard. When I come to America, I come for invitation of the Colorado State University. I got my degree in plant and agriculture in my country. My master's degree in plant genetics in Colombia. I was doing my PhD in Colorado State University. I come from invitation of the Colorado State University because I was the head of the program in this product. Maybe you know, maybe not. Kilo. Okay. This grain is very close to 5,000 or 10,000 years old. Ancient grain. The same this, I have a power over here. Kanyawa, it's another ancient grain. It's making powder. You know, when you go to school, we got a degrees, we have a reading books, we thinking we have all the answers for everything because the science, I'm sorry, the science, I suspect science, I suspect technology, but we think in the science they go to the level of the control of the mother nature. Never ever is possible to control to mother nature. And that's the difference between the indigenous people we are connected with the mother nature. We touching when we have to touching her. We are not abusing her. Okay? That's important. This relation given to us, to the indigenous people, to saving what we fighting now, seven generations, in this philosophy to save my children. Our ancestors, they have this vision to building a healthy life, not building highways to transporting food from one side to the other side. When you thinking to buy your car or all these type of the things, you go under this concrete or the asphalt. What are we doing with that? We oppressing to the mother earth, they can keep breathing, okay? And that's why we have all these, I would say, ecological disasters in many different places. I was reading one of the books when I found, for example, one, you know, very remote place when we're talking about Alaska. It's one Indian place there, maybe one of the very youngest, I would say, in this civilization ways, okay? It's the let me find the name of this uh, Kasi Gluck, that's the name of the place. These people, they live very close to the river and they have actually the only ways before the civilization, because when we think in civilization, we think in very advanced cultures, in the way we're using microwaves, cell phones, cars, you know, all these type of the things they can come into your heart and beginning to thinking how much damage you do into mother nature in the way you using and you buying and taking. Because in this country, nine, the ten children they eating, seven children they eat. Means 
eating McDonald's, fast food, Coca-Cola. This is the country, the advanced country where we have all these names we say, low fat food, diet, drink. It is the country where we have the highest percentage of the children in obesity and problems of the health. When we're talking about farmers market, I agree to farmers market, but I agree 100% in the way indigenous community has to be sustainable and independent, producing his own food. I don't want to drive in myself, okay? I am part of the Pueblo of the Tezuke because I feel in the same my brothers, because indigenous people, we have the same way of the life. I have to hear the con. We call it my language, Tuspillo, okay? I will pass around you guys, they can open and testing. What we need for that? We need the fire and we need the path to making this in our place. We don't have to go to buy this guy he making heavy digestion because we don't know how long they are in the storage. We don't know what type of the oil they are using, and we are and we are in competition to making money to buy all these type of the things they making sick. And then you have to make more money to pay the doctors. I'm sorry. This is the stress we're living in these times, in this moment. Okay? I will say, you know, we're talking about Cota T, we're talking the Verdolaga or Portula Coloresia, you know, so many things. I was in Mexico visiting the Tarumara Indian guys. Okay? And then over here, chia is very expensive. It's seven, eight dollars. The same quinoa. You know, it's very, it's very sad. In my country, quinoa was Indian food. But now, you cannot be able to find quinoa in the market in Bolivia. Because everything coming to U.S. And thanks to the spirit of the quinoa, I'm talking to you. Because this grain brings me to this country. I was eating quinoa all the time. I was having the program in my country for this grain. Sometimes you say it's better to put these seeds all over because people they can have option to eat what other people they can eat. We like to eat pasta, we like to eat pizza. You know, all these type of the things, they begin to, to management to the population in the way they giving to you this this packaging, these names or you know these big things, it's making nice to your to your face and then you buy this type of these things. But you are not able to go to your garden and planting and looking <coughs> and making these chilies. These chilies coming from Tezuki. We harvest three hundred pounds already. All these products we're making distribution to our people, okay? We're trying. The 17th of this month, we're going to making a food for the elders. Why? Because we don't care about them. We buy junk food in boxes with this label. We are not able to do these things. I'm sorry to say this. We're coming to be lazy and dependable, okay? What happens if we don't have cars? We have to make in attention the things we have in our place around us. We're making tomatoes. It's very nice to see, for example, the lady there, Claudia. She's the assistant to manager in the kitchen in the suke. It's a slowly, slowly, you know, it's hard because we are not many people. I have Lujina, all the people, they're helping in some things. These fresh tomatoes, we grow in, for example, in the, in the seed bank, we have another attachment where we have a, a small a greenhouse there. But we planting 18 different type of the tomatoes to see which one they can go better, etc. Et we don't have time to make research or, or making science or application of the science. 
we try the best we can, okay? Tomatoes is very high in what? In vitamin C. When the European people, they come to America, they look into the indigenous people eating potatoes. They say, these people, they eating these things. We don't know what it is, okay? And then the potatoes, it was one of the crops they saving to one whole country, Irlanda, okay? Because it was all the crops, it was gone. Only potatoes saving to this country. And we're thinking potatoes is coming from Irlanda, okay? Potatoes come from South America. Tomatoes, the same thing. You know, the best thing the indigenous people give to the world is the food. That's it, okay? Corn is all over. Potatoes is all over, okay? Now, it's ironic to see this type of the situation. In my country, we have to buy potatoes from Holland, okay? Because we want to have French fry when we have more than 10 different types, 10,000 different types of the tubers in the seed bank, okay? Corn, it's another important crop. Where they come from indigenous people. This beans, probably you know very well, it's an assassin beans. Another high culture in this country. Disappear, they go, but they lead to a something. That's the heritage of the beans, okay? I don't want to go and talking and talking and talking because it's so much to say. But the time this guy was pushing me, it's time. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I will, I will try to reduce the conversation with two words, okay? I have over here, maybe you know this product, maybe yes, maybe not. It's, uh, maybe it's like a, a candy. There is dry potatoes we call chuño, okay? It's uh, actually, when we're talking about how we can save in the, uh, I'm not going to say we are the answer. Probably the answer is work together, okay? This knowledge of my people making dry potatoes. You can save in potatoes for 10 years, 20 years. No insect damage, one thing. Second one, they cannot be attacked for rodents because it's like a, a rock, okay? When you want to eat potatoes, it's, uh, you know, in my country, it's uh, actually any time we can have frost in the highlands. But this, these guys, they have the intelligence and we're thinking we are more intelligent than the elders of the indigenous people in some ways. So this knowledge is, it's, we're talking a lot about the generic erosion, you know, many of these other type of technical things. The human erosion also is affecting to the life in this planet. We have to recover the knowledge of the, our elders, the nuestros abuelitos, because they are like a library. They have so much knowledge. If we're talking about medicine, if we're talking about food, we're talking about anything. I was looking at my grandfather when he was planting with the stars, you know? We talk about biodynamics, we're talking about the, all these other new things that appeared in these times. The indigenous people already, they have all these type of things. And we are not discovering anything. And that's important to me, for example, here, I have another product for my people. It's Oxalis tuberosum, oca, dry oca. You put in water and you can eat like a fresh. You know, this knowledge, you don't see in books. Why? Because the indigenous people knowledge is not very good knowledge, okay? <coughs> That's what I said myself when we, I saw this title, this brother, he was talking. It's very, it's not very easy topic to say things, okay? But I will say, you know, this knowledge and this food, is going to saving ourselves if we have time to recover and practice. And that's important, okay? Here I have another product. Maybe you know, or maybe not. It's pap quinoa, the same it's pap corn, okay? Making ancient times, okay? So many things we can talk and talk and talk and talk. Here it's Mexican people, panelita or, uh, I don't know what the other name you guys they have. So it's more healthy than the white sugar you have to use, okay? Now we have a stevia. You go out to the store and you find, for example, the stevia. The white stevia because we like to have like a, 
a white, you know, very fancy things, etc., etc. But the best thing to eat, it's better to go and back to eat raw. We grow in the Pueblo, Jesus. Okay? We say this is the first time we're going to do Margaret Braskovitz doing some type of the work with the children because they say we cannot teach already the old people. Because the old people already we have this, I would say, this defect from this society. Our hope it's in these younger generations. We have to back to them with the education. Thank you much for giving me your time. Thank you so much. Dr. Ford, would you like to? Um, well, I, I, yeah, I feel like I'm talking to the converted. But there are a couple of things I would like to say following up on some comments of Deborah and, and Louie. And those comments are that there is still a critical dimension to saving traditional foods. We can have them available for us at the farmer's market. We can work with our local farmers to purchase those traditional foods. There are still other things, however, that we can do. And there are two, I think. It relates to education. One is the education of the young people and getting them doing what Molly Toll is doing, teaching them in the classroom about the traditional foods of New Mexico and getting them accustomed to hearing the names and knowing something about how they are used in the cuisine. The second thing, though, is training adults, yourselves, how we can grow efficiently the different foods that we're talking about, whether, not saying that we convert our own yards into a garden, although I think it would be worth doing, but there are certain small plants that can be raised and that becomes educational. And I have two parts to that. When I first came out here from Michigan in 2007, I had long been had a house out here. And I'd always been enamored of, of uh, Mark Simmons' history column. And I thought, wow, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could have an ethnobotanical column in the newspaper that would talk about the various indigenous plants that occur here, what we know about them ecologically, and how you use them. So I brought it to the uh, Santa Fe New Mexican, and they said, no, everybody knows about these. You don't, we don't need anything like that. So that was one line of education that was thwarted. Uh, I didn't do like Louis does. I didn't go to the state legislature because I knew that would be a dead end. But on the other hand, I have gone, and some of my colleagues are here, and that is we went to the Santa Fe Botanical Garden. And we said, you know, we would like to do some different types of permaculture education through the Santa Fe Botanical Garden and put in things and teach people how you do mulch gardening for water conservation, for water uh, storage in the soil, and we would like to put in various kinds of uh, pre-contact agricultural techniques that we know work. And we can then have there teaching people how to raise traditional crops. And this would include various plants in terms of the term I used yesterday, ruderals, not weeds. Uh, weed is something that grows out of place. Ruderals are plants that are useful for people. And so that we could have those in, in this area and use it as an educational thing. When these come up, we teach people how you use them and what have you. 
So this is a program that several of us in the audience are trying to work with the Santa Fe Botanical Garden to put in place and use as a public education, both as a workshop, teaching people how you do this kind of work because it is very useful around your own house for saving plants, for saving water, conserving water and saving plants that with education you can use. So this, these are things that we have in mind for being local, local in terms of our own daily lives that I think are important for uh, the kind of saving of tradition that we all should be engaged in because it makes our life both more healthful as well as I think intellectually more fun. So those are my comments. Thank you so much. Again, you know, when I first um, opened up this discussion, I had talked about the struggles that I have with this question. For myself, um, coming from a farming tribe, um, farming in the desert, using traditional methods like flood-based farming, um, 50 years ago, we could get oh, our, our tribe um, in different villages, the different communities, um, all together produce 1.5 million pounds of turkey beans. Um, Ten years ago, you couldn't even get that much. You couldn't even get 100 pounds. So with, um, with what I was talking about, the struggle, you know, our tribe was uh, titled the, the largest uh, group in the world, ethnic group in the world with type 2 diabetes. And it was because we were very away from traditional foods and went to these kind of foods. Um, so we started growing. We uh, started growing our tepary beans. And I think our very first harvest, we got over 8,000 um, pounds. You know, and from there it grew. And we started distributing and selling. And our first goal was to make sure that it was accessible and available to community members. Uh, people started getting excited about this new bean, this flavorful bean, this magic bean. You know, and so we started packaging it and marketing it. The struggle we're having now is what, where should we be growing for the mass market or should we be growing for our community? So that was the thing that we're struggling with right now. You know, because my first priority is I want to make sure that the kids have it every day in school, that it's accessible to the community because, you know, you can't just go to your market and buy it there. When you come on the reservation, if you come to our supermarket, the only market um, on the reservation um, that is the size of Connecticut, there's only one supermarket. You know, and so we work with them, and we it's a chain. We work with them, and they carry um, some of our products. So, so you know, this is this is an amazing discussion, and just hearing different perspectives, and uh, I would love to continue this. You know. Um, but we're actually almost out of time. <laughs> but so that's the question here. You know, the thing is that, you know, does going local, you know, preserve the traditional foods? Because are you serving the, the community it's coming from, or are you serving the community as a whole, as, as the outside community? Because Again, you know, when I see, when I go to, I, I love going to farmer's markets. I love going, and from a, from a person that grew up from the res, and only know the res, but having the opportunity to go to different markets and see the different foods that I never even seen or heard about and taste, you know, I, I will wander off and I'll, I'll come up to uh, a booth that are selling temporary beans, and it's, it's Anglo people. You know, and I, 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 I tease them and I question them and <laughs> pretend that, oh, I don't know what a tippery bean is. And they're like, yeah, you, know, you can make chili, you can do this and that. And I'm like, okay, but where did you get the bean? You know, oh, well, and that's the question, you know. And for myself, I know where the beans came from. You know, and I know the stories, I know the songs, I know the prayers, you know. So that's, I kind of look at it as a double edged sword. So, you know, and it's, it's really interesting, and I'm going to do some plug-ins.
So in our magazine, Native Food Ways, we highlight and we tell the stories of different community people from around the country, Native community people, and what they're trying to do in their community to preserve their traditional foods, to keep their traditional foods alive, but also to pass it on to the young people, because it is the young people that are going to be keeping it alive. And it starts with them. It starts with them. So um, we actually are giving these out. You can go to the registration table and ask for them. But also, do us a favor. Go to your local bookstore. Go to your local someplace where you think they might want to carry this. Because the more people that know about it, the more support that we gain will definitely help community, Native communities um, the ability to do it on their own, to try to work and preserve their own traditional ways, their own traditional food ways. So again, thank you again, panelists. Thank you, it was an honor, and um, everyone have a good night. Carol, we don't have to run off. Why don't we let the audience ask some questions?